Hey, it's time once again for voiceover body shop or VO. BS. That's right. Anyway, uh, we got a great show tonight. If you are interested in cybersecurity, well, everybody looks at that and their eyes roll to the back of their head. Well, you should be. Yeah. It's time to get interested. It, it, it's because everybody's, we're all online and we've got to- Pop your head out of the sand and watch this show. Absolutely. Because our guest tonight is a an expert in cybersecurity and a voice actor, but not a lawyer, interestingly enough. Uh, Luke Turan. Luke, say hi. Hello. All right. He's going to talk about cybersecurity and also our very good friend from Orlando and our number one website- for voiceover guys, Joe Davis. Joe, how you doing? Doing well. Just playing some guitar, auto harp, banjo, mandolin, Irish penny whistle, you know, entertaining myself. All right. And feeding dandelions to squirrels. That's right. <laughs> and that. So if, <laughs> if you've got a question on cybersecurity for your VO website and for your online VO life and all that kind of stuff, stay tuned. We got great guests who can answer your questions on these coming up now on Voiceover Body Shop now from the outer reaches they came bearing the knowledge of what it takes yes. to properly record your voiceover audio <laughs> and together from the center of the vo universe they bring it to you now george widom the engineer to the vo stars a virginia tech grad with the skills to build set up and maintain the professional vo studios of the biggest names in vo today and you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week they allow you into their world, bringing you talks with the biggest names in the voiceover world today, letting you ask your questions and giving you the latest information to make the most of your voiceover business. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, Remote Studio Connections for Everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt. VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Greetings, I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO. B -S. B S. And here yeah. we are in, in the brand new voiceover body shop complex. As we can see, the uh, our staff working hard up there, getting us all the latest voiceover news. <laughs> <laughs> looking good, looking good. It is, it is. And we've got a great guest tonight. Uh, Luke Churan's going to be with us, and Joe Davis. Again, if you've got questions for them about cybersecurity for your online VO life. Now is the time to ask it. Uh, I know Jeff Holman is in the chat room uh, in Facebook because we got rid of the other chat room. It was, yes. yeah, but Facebook is a lot, lot easier. Uh, so you streamline everything and that's how you make things work better. So how are you surviving so far? Um, doing Getting lonely. Doing fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, getting out of the house a little bit more here and there. Um, you know, it's, it's, I get out more often than many, many people probably do because of being in Topanga, you can get up into the hills, get up into the mountains, sneak around a little bit. There are still places to go if you're, if you know where to look. And so that's, that's really helped quite a lot. And the fact that I, you know, some of us have yards, we can go outside, get fresh air, you know, so it's, it's, it's getting old. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but it's not a massive adjustment for people that for me who, who works from home, a lot, yeah. but I know there's some clients of mine who would sure love me to come over, whether I have yeah. to wear a scuba suit, scuba, <laughs> scuba or rebreather tank to do it. Really? So it uh, might be happening sooner than later that I might be coming out seeing yeah. clients again, somehow yeah. Tyvek suit, maybe. Yeah, there you go. Right, the thing is, is who's going to know except them. 
I mean, is there like a a a a home uh, a home visit police out there or something? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. No. Yeah. No, I mean as long as the as long as both parties are, you know, can what is the word? There's consent. Yeah. Consenting yeah, mutual adults, consent, yes. <laughs> So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, but, can't uh, wait. Yeah, no, it's going well working remotely. I mean, I'm, I'm just for, fortunate that this is something that we, you, Dan, too, but been we've been doing this for so long, remote support. So it hasn't been a terrible adjustment. No, uh, but there's just maybe, a lot more of it. There's just a lot more of it. We're staying <laughs> quite busy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, because we do things online, we have to, you know, there are other people out there that want to take advantage of the fact that we're all online. And uh, so tonight we decided we'd get somebody on who knows the voiceover world well, because he's a well-established voice actor, but he's also someone who has been involved in cybersecurity. An excellent combination. Let's welcome Luke Truan. Luke, welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on the show today. Now, that's an interesting combination of things that you do. Uh, So... You know, you're, you're, you're a voice actor, but you've been in the cybersecurity business. And I, my immediate thought was, and you're doing voiceover? I don't quite get it. Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about how you've been able to mix your careers of cybersecurity and voiceover? Yeah, basically, I, I love two different things really well. You know, voiceover, cybersecurity. And uh, even after I stopped doing cybersecurity full time, I still kept it as something that I did uh, to kind of keep my studio functioning properly and make sure it was secured. And uh, so, yeah, it just kind of kept, um, kept going even after I was out of the industry. And then voiceover is just totally fun and awesome. You, know, you get to work in your PJs and uh, oh, at your house. So, yeah. What kind of stuff, have, what, what kind of uh, products and types of voiceover work have you been doing? Uh, so recently I finished an Intel and brand uh, slash explainer video, which was really fun. Super fun with a local marketing company right here in Atlanta. Cool. All right. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're going to talk to us about a newsletter that, uh, that you've been putting out because, you know, as I was saying, when, when you start talking cybersecurity, it's like, I'll let the cybersecurity people do that. Right, right. <laughs> but then, then, <laughs> then you get all these these reminders. You know, there's a vulnerability here. There's a vulnerability there. What tell us? Tell us about this this biweekly newsletter that you're starting. It's called the Vox Roundup. Right. So it's called the Vox Roundup, and it's uh, it's V O C S. So it's a play on you know voiceover cybersecurity. You're right. Blah blah blah. And so it. Um, it's just one of those things that I was already doing for myself. And so I figured that other people could definitely benefit from the research I'm already doing. And so I decided to start uh, a little newsletter, which is going to be launching really soon. Right now, people can sign up, obviously, ahead of time. But yeah, that's so that's kind of um, the current state. And then what it actually is, I would, I would call it like uh, the latest cybersecurity news related to voiceover and studio technology. So it's kind of related to not just the tech, but also to business aspects as well. Hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, it's amazing when you, you click on something and it's like, oh, why did I click on that? The people are, they're very, very good at disguising what things are and, and they're mm-hmm. getting better right. at it. Uh, you know, with, with all the technology threats and vulnerabilities that we we're just talking about, how do you know what is a real threat and if it could affect the technology being used in your voiceover studio? Well, that's a great question. So when I do research, I do use some special capabilities that are available even in Google that a lot of people don't even know about it. And being a cybersecurity background, uh, I kind of had been using those my entire career. And so I just like, hey, why don't I just use them to do my research uh, to kind of find the vulnerabilities? And then so, I'm able to find very relevant uh, vulnerabilities using these search capabilities that are directly related to, you know, computers, software, web-based tech, and of course, any studio gear, if it does happen, which is more rare for the gear to actually have a vulnerability, but it does happen. And then I take that and apply it directly to voiceover. Makes complete sense. But right. yeah, how is it that, but why? Well, I, I guess we could ask, why would people do this? Of course, they want to be able to make money being able to 
threaten our security and taking our, you know, our social security numbers and our bank accounts and all these other things. But what are some of the other things that, that, you know, that ha these hackers are trying to do to us? Well, not only are they trying to trick you, but they're obviously trying to steal your identity, which is a really big issue. And then once they um, steal your identity, obviously it's, um, and they can really do anything at that point, but uh, they'll trick you, you know, through phishing campaigns, through um, stuff you can't even see online. Like you can hit a website and there's something called a cross-site scripting vulnerability or a drive-by or a pop-under. And if your browser, say Chrome, has a, um, an unpatched vulnerability, they could immediately have access to your, uh, your browser and then start loading things in memory. And they could technically take over your computer and then plant other stuff to kind of take it even farther and escalate privileges. Hmm. So it's, it's really automated these days. So it's hard to know when that's actually going to hit your space. So it's good to have everything kind of taken care of all the time. Yeah. So I, I, there must be new threat. There's new threats all the time. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. I mean, I opened my email the other day and it was, it, you know, I can't remember who it was for, but it was something in windows because I was working on a PC and suddenly it's like, it's it, it every time I try to open a program, it opens another program and I just click on it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what is that? Somebody just trying to, just trying to plant spam or what are they doing? Well, I mean, that could be any number of things. That could be a, um, an, a malicious advertisement that's on a web page that they, uh, they have decided to do you know, an actual paid-for advertisement with Google, which has been known to be malicious. But Google scans for that now a lot more than they used to. But still, every now and then, it'll pop up because they do new techniques to get those ads through you know, the, uh, the checkpoints. And so it could be something like an ad or it could be some temporary file that was actually downloaded to your system that get, then gets um, activated at a different point in time. So it could be a lot of different things. Hmm. I mean, I mean, immediately, I'm, I'm what the one thing is, is it's like I open, you know, if I open a program, immediately another program opens up. Or if I open a web page, it's something go, oh, you want this, don't you? I'm like, no, I just click out of it, but it keeps doing it. Now I got to figure out how to get rid of it, which is one of the more interesting things. Right. That's things. part of the pop ups. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, so who is this information for? And is the information going to be super technical in your newsletter? So yeah, the information is actually for um, for all voiceover pros. I mean, it's kind of a relaxed format, uh, but it's it's kind of like a coffee shop style, you know, approach to technical issues that we all need to kind of know the information to. And um, I kind of like to say, you know, we've done the work, or I've done the work, and you get to sit back and you know see if it applies to your studio. You know, not all of everything is going to apply to your studio all the time, but if you have something that's easy to understand in a non-technical way, you can, um, you know, quickly see if that does apply to your studio and um, dive even deeper because there's going to be some quick links in the newsletter as well as some short commentary. And uh, I always like to say there's going to be some uh, TLDR type style comments if you don't even want to get long. into the article. Didn't read. Right. Exactly. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those are one of those, those are those acronyms that I've seen around the web. I must have seen TL semicolon DR a million times and didn't know what the heck they were talking about. I had to Google it, <laughs> but that's what it means. Right. That's Google's good for that. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would read, I would read something like this if it was simple and how are you planning on taking these chunks of information that are just basically, you know, geek speak and turn them into the average voice actor can actually understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so that, um, you know, throughout a career of being in that field, you know, I've had to learn how to actually explain technical concepts to what's, you know, considered the C-level, right? Non-technical group, of it, which is an audience. And so I'm very used to breaking down really advanced concepts into non-technical you know, language. And so I'm going to use that ability to kind of do the same with each article as it's necessary. And I'll, you know, I'll read through the articles pretty quickly and, um, you know, I can digest them pretty quickly because I'm familiar with the content and I can scan through it and see if it applies to any voiceover type of studio gear pretty quickly. 
Right. So, cause I, I can, I can read really quickly. So that's super important. I mean, I know, I know for Dan and I too, when we're working with voice actors, we're dealing with a different kind of tech, but we're still trying to be really cautious to not over jargonize or over, you overly use jargon and that because it's it's very easy to throw jargon at it like tldr tldr you know these are languages <laughs> it's almost like a second language that is spoken in computer circles so um more and more you know c level is that what you said c level yeah it's the executive level. level yeah executive yeah. level more and more yeah. that stuff's trickling into those worlds they're getting more and more of that especially as you work with younger um mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's we definitely work really hard to make sure everybody understands these concepts. So I get that totally is. I'm glad that you're doing that because I don't know anybody else really doing that for this field. It's awesome. Yeah, what, what's a good example of saying taking something like what you were just saying? C. What, what was that, George? C. C level. C level. So I hadn't heard it. C, I haven't heard that term before. But C level meaning executive level. So right. when you're dealing with executives in a big company. They don't want to hear too much jargon. They don't want to hear a lot of detail. They need to know the really important stuff, the bullet points, the things that are going to matter to them in a way they understand. So that's C-level, right? Right. That's right. Take the same approach, You know, review the article, see how it applies to the different technology piece and apply it to the voiceover you know, space. And then what you do is like some fun commentary. You don't make it boring and um, uninteresting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. one of the things that, you know, what, one of the great things in the voiceover business is that a lot of people use Macs. Of course, when they use a PC, I go, you really need to be using a Mac for, for voiceover uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and then, of course, there are the people who are political. I would never use a Mac. Well, OK, that's that's your problem. But you know, do I need to worry about so much about cybersecurity so much if if I have you know, a good old, you know, Mac laptop here or, or a Mac mini or something like that. I, they used to say that, be, you know, because not as many people had Macs, even though they're like one of the biggest companies in the world now, that they, it was a PC world and people were not trying to attack Macs. I take it that has changed a bit. That has changed quite, quite a bit. A lot more than I think people realize. Um, Malwarebytes actually just released a study that over the last year, the um, Mac attack vectors and the Mac uh, frequency of attacks is actually, I think they said it had quadrupled. It was like a crazy amount of increase. And so it's even even getting um, worse as the years go on. So it's, it's only increasing at this point. So yes, even if you have a Mac, you still need to be mindful of these cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities. Um, you know, I can give you a quick example of Please. one that Sure. Um, on May 11th, there was an article about the Thunderbolt vulnerability. I don't know if you guys saw that. Nope. So it basically says that if an attacker had physical access, they could easily plug in a flash drive and run some software programs and uh, read anything out of memory and out of an encrypted hard drive, even if your laptop is locked and unattended because of this vulnerability oh. with a thunderbolt right wow hmm. so it's okay. they would custom code like uh like a program and let's say that you're at starbucks or whatever and uh, we're, we're not really doing that a lot right now but if you were yeah. uh, you and you let's say you went to get a couple napkins it would take them literally about 20 30 seconds maybe less to pop into flash drive go one two three four five or less and the program would run, they'd get whatever they wanted, and then they could unplug the flash drive and be out of there. And it's all possible because of this Thunderbolt vulnerability. Hmm. But this so, is a Thunderbolt flash drive, right? It has to be a Thunderbolt flash drive. Obviously, yeah, it could be something yeah, like yeah. that. Somebody could custom make something. Um, yeah. But if, you know, stuff like that, um, if it's not patched, like if you didn't know that there was a patch because you don't follow cybersecurity, which a lot of people don't, then you wouldn't run the security updates maybe that week. But if you kind of had something come into your inbox that said, hey, you know, there's this vulnerability, you would easily go, okay, well, I can just build that into my little admin time that I do each week for my studio, which you should be doing that, by the way. And then you could patch it and then you would, you know, cut that one out of the mix. Yeah. How quick are, are the companies like, say, Mac and, and, you know, and Microsoft 
at finding these vulnerabilities? I, I take it they've probably got staffs and staffs of people just watching the internet and going, oh, we've got this problem. Or is it something that's like, hey, you know, you got a vulnerability here. You want to, might want to fix this. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite that loose. They're actually extremely tight with their, um, their security. Um, they have, like you said, they have teams and teams, you know, doing nothing but that. And they actually have their own, you know, penetration testing and, you know, R&D and quality control and, you know, all sorts of teams. But then on top of that, they open up these bug bounty programs for the hackers of the world to get paid basically to break into their stuff. Hmm. So there's a lot of people helping them out in addition to their own staff. Wow. So Windows does the same thing. Microsoft does the same thing. Yeah. So it's important to, well, one, have antivirus software on your, on your computer and anti-malware and all these other things. But right. like you were saying, make sure that you are doing the updates when they come. Uh, right. Yeah. There was a Safari vulnerability not too long ago for Mac specifically that involved um, an unpatched Safari version um, could actually, they could gain access to your web camera. So that one's pretty, pretty relevant to pretty much everybody. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't see anything interesting. So, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, you wouldn't even know potentially that it was happening unless you're, you know, you saw your light on. Right. Right. But um, yeah, you could easily hit a malicious website and then uh, the, you know, they would be in if yeah. the malicious code was on that website or you got redirected to it by another means like a phishing attack like your Netflix account has been hacked, click here to, you know, immediately respond. Cause they always say, do it immediately to get right. you to uh, act really quickly. Right. Jargon alert, jargon alert. Yeah. Jargon alert. Right. Fish attack, <laughs> fishing attack. Tell everybody, <laughs> tell everybody what a phishing attack is. So yeah. A phishing attack is basically a very, very convincing email that looks like it's from a major service provider, like, like a bank, like Wells Fargo or Netflix or OneDrive, which is a file sharing service for Microsoft. And these emails are so convincing that they look like they actually came from the provider. And when you click on it, typically now the link would go to a website, which would run the code, but they also have these really official looking landing pages that look exactly like the, um, the office login page, for example, right, or a bank page. And then you would type your credentials in thinking you're logging in, then they could have your credentials or they could run any code they want while you're on the website. And especially if you don't have a patched a vulnerability, then that makes it even easier for them to get into your system and do whatever they want, steal identity, plant key loggers, you know, blah, 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 whatever. Right. Don't like a domain name, over. like a domain name, like googlesearch.com or something. Right. Well, it's like with google.com. Yeah, not Google.com, but it would be like um, a.google.com or some other, yeah. you know, high level domain, like another part of the Google.com would be in front of that to the left of the uh, the name. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen companies like just tack on another word right at the end of a major company's name. So it, it looks kind of official, but it's not actually Google.com. For example, it's something else. Yeah, exactly. Zoom, that's part of the Zoom vulnerability that was an issue with the redirections and the uh, the fake URLs that were floating around. Yeah. Oh, oh really? Yeah. 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 And, I, and I got Zoom bombed early on when we first started. Everybody started Zooming and it was like, oh, how do you get, you know, and they, they quickly shut that down and they, and they really are improving their, their security. So why is it these people who are so brilliant at computers and, and hacking and all this stuff, why aren't they running the companies? <laughs> that do all the websites they're really oh good now, at we can, it. <laughs> now we can talk about black hat versus white hat yeah exactly right, right. or gray hat you know somebody that dances between both like neo in the matrix you know yeah. oh yeah like, like a double agent right like a double agent right yeah fascinating so when are you planning on launching uh you know, the vox newsletter um yeah so i was going to do it on the 18th which is next monday excellent and, and how, how are people going to be able to sign up? Um, they can actually go to the vocsroundup.com. Brilliant. And it's right there. Just click on get the newsletter and you'll get a nice little welcome email that kind of introduces you to it. And when we go live, uh, you'll get the, the newsletter, first, first edition. All right. 
Well, think, I think now it's time to bring in another guy who we know knows computers inside out, backwards, and upside down, especially when it comes to websites. And that is the principal guy over at voiceactorwebsites.com, Joe Davis. Joe, welcome back to our show once again. Thank you so much. I, uh, I'm just looking forward to getting a pop under here. <laughs> no, you won't get one. I... So y your job, you know, your business is building voice actor websites. And I, you're very busy doing that. What can people do to make sure that their website is as secure as possible, as, as Luke was talking about? It's a good question. So, um, and just to clarify now, we, we don't just work with voice actors. We do agents, producers, casting, ca casting directors, ad agencies. So um, lots of areas that are attached to the voiceover industry too. And there's some um, basic things on the website side, but before even we go there, I wanna say the stuff that Luke was talking about is relevant to your website also, because if someone compromises your computer, most likely they're gonna be able to get access to the credentials for your website. So I'll dig into that a little bit more later. But uh, let's say you have a, a website on WordPress and you say, okay, you know, I go in every six months to make a change. Well, that means it's probably outdated, meaning WordPress issues updates just like Windows or OS X or Safari or Chrome. All of these software platforms offer updates. WordPress does the same thing. And sometimes you can go a month or two without an update. Sometimes there's multiple updates per month if vulnerabilities are found. And so the, the more frequently that something goes wrong, meaning someone discovers one of these vulnerabilities, the more likely that an update is gonna come. And some of them are minor, meaning um, there's very little likelihood that anyone will ever actually use this or it's not that dangerous. But other times, um, Luke and I were having a conversation over the weekend and there was a WordPress vulnerability that happened uh, within the last week or two that was quite significant. So um, you wanna make sure that you're staying on top of those type of updates. When WordPress issues an update, I would say, in general, maybe depending on how complex your website is, you might want to wait a day or, or you know, a few hours just to make sure that if there's a problem with that update, it gets caught before you do it. So sometimes being the first person to update anything is not a good idea because that can introduce new bugs. I see Luke laughing, so he, he knows what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, in general, keeping on top of those updates is a good idea. And then most websites have plugins and themes, and especially uh, on the WordPress platform, which is a great platform. Uh, it's the most popular CMS, content management system out there, meaning uh, kind of a drag and drop interface to creating a website. Uh, it relies on a theme beyond the, the WordPress core, a theme and plugins. And those things need to be kept up to date too, because again, vulnerabilities are discovered. Uh, and also conflicts happen. So sometimes maybe WordPress issues an update that breaks something with a plugin that you've had. And so even if there's not a vulnerability, you should stay on top of those updates because uh, after one or two generations, sometimes your plugins will just stop working. Right. That's what I pay you to do though. <laughs> it's like, I don't understand what this thing is. It's supposed to update it. And... Good to have friends in mid-level places. That, that, that's, that's a very important thing to have. Uh, if you're just joining us, our guests are Luke Truan, who is a, a cybersecurity expert and voice actor and is launching uh, the Vox Roundup, which is a newsletter for voice actors for and, and others to talk about cybersecurity that you can understand. And Joe Davis, of course, from voiceactorwebsites.com, who uh, manages a lot of our websites and gets them all set up. If you've got a question for them, now would be a great time to throw it into the Facebook chat room or in the comments there. And Jeff Holman is standing by and we'll be able to reload the, relay those questions to our great guests uh, in just a couple of minutes. So I, really, is, is our website really tied to, you know, our entire computer security? I mean, can people get into my computer if they were able to hack into my website? Potentially. So uh, again, just like Luke was saying that if you visit a website that is compromised in some way and there's malicious code on there and it's able to be executed on your computer, the same is true of your own website. And so if your website is compromised and there's bad code on there that hackers have done something um, that 
maybe downloads a file to your computer, uh, that can potentially give them access. And so um, the, the two securities of both your own computer at home and your website, I'd say, are definitely connected. Now, what a lot of hackers will do is they don't want the owner of the website to know that their website has been compromised because it's more valuable to them that they are able to collect data or infect visitors to the website because that represents a much larger pool as opposed to just infecting the owner. And so what they'll do is they'll make the malicious code only run when someone comes from a Google search. So with a website, it's possible to tell the entry point, meaning um, how did someone come into the website? Did they type in the URL directly or did they come from Google, Yahoo, Bing, one of the search engines? And so what they'll do is once the hackers get control of your website, they will inject this code that says, don't run anything bad if the website is typed in directly, only run this bad code if it comes from Google. Therefore, a website owner is a lot less likely to know that it happened. And I've seen this happen many times where someone's completely unaware that their website has been hacked because they don't go to Google to find themselves, they type in their own website. And so when they type in their own website, everything looks fine. Only when someone comes in from a search does that bad code get executed. Um, but again, it, it goes in both directions. So if your website is compromised, it could potentially compromise your computer. And if your computer's compromised, it can definitely compromise your website. If you've saved those logins in your web browser, if you've saved them in a Word document, uh, if you have a password manager and they get those credentials, there's a lot of ways that it could cause major problems. So you wanna keep both up to date. Any security is only as strong as its weakest link. Yeah. I mean, I, when I noticed that, you know, that somebody had, you know, somebody successfully fished me, it doesn't happen often because I'm usually pretty sharp about that. But this one was like, it was like, it was, it was a Google thing. And it's, mm -hmm. you've got to update this. And I'm like, eh. but what did I immediately do is I changed my Google password. So, uh, which is, I guess, an important thing to do probably fairly, fairly often. Hackers are clever, and um, that is something you can do is change your password on a regular basis. But um, utilizing people's own, not, nothing to do with um, security in and of itself, but utilizing people's uh, desire to, to help to want to do the right thing is also something that hackers take advantage of. So um, there's these um, stories that you read about periodically where the hackers will want to get into a system that is closed off from the internet. And so what they do is they take a thumb drive, which is, um, has its own internet access, and they leave it next to the parking spot of an employee of a business that they wanna gain access to. What happens? The employee goes out to his car, sees a, a thumb drive, wants to be helpful, says, oh, I wanna return this to whoever it is, let me see who owns it, plugs it into their computer, suddenly their computer is compromised. Mm. So um, while it's wonderful to do the right thing, you have to be careful. Right. And that's, that's a, a, a different version of phishing. You know, that's not sending an email. That's actually a physical form of phishing. Yeah. Once again, if you've got a question for Luke Truan on uh, cybersecurity for your VO world or Joe Davis, who uh, is talking about cybersecurity for your websites, throw it in the chat room right now so we can get to him. Because right now we're going to take a break and we're going to try and get to some of those questions right after these incredibly important messages. So stay right there. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The Voice of Our Body Shop. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? This is Virgin Radio. Well, okay, we're not that innocent. There's jeans for wearing and there's jeans for working. Dickies. Because I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. It's just you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. 
Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. Well, hey there, Hero. We interrupt the award-winning shenanigans of VoiceOver Body Shop for this public service announcement. $1.5 billion. That's how many students there are in the world. Primary, secondary, college, university. $1.5 billion. And that's how many were sent home several weeks ago, along with the 90 million teachers and professors who teach them. And as they left, those teachers and professors were all told by their principals and deans, hey, keep teaching your classes from home, okay? Yeah, you know how to do that, what, that Facebook Live thing and that YouTube and that Zoom thing? You know how to do that, don't you? Sure, everybody does, except many of those teachers don't even know where to start. What camera to use, what microphone to use, how to set up lights, how to use Zoom. And what makes online classes different from in-person classes? But I do. I know how to do that. I've been doing that for years, and I thought, well, maybe I can help. So I spent day and night for the past few weeks putting together a course on how teachers can do all that. And I figured, uh, you know what, I'll sell it for 49 bucks. Anybody can afford 49 bucks, right? But then, at the last minute, I decided to do something different. I decided to set aside the money and give it away for free. So now through May 6th, any teacher can have the course forever for free. And I've got a favor to ask of you. If you're a teacher, or if you know a teacher or two, and with 90 million in the world who doesn't know a teacher or two, would you let them know about this? The course is available at teachyourcourseonline.com. And I'm going to ask Dan and George to make that link available on the VOBS website and maybe mention it a time or two on the air and in the notices that they sent out. Would you guys do that for me? Okay, great. The course again is at teachyourcourseonline.com. Help me help teachers be heroes at home as well as in the classroom. That's teachyourcourseonline.com. Thank you very much. As a voice talent, you have to have a website, but what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. <clears throat> Which camera? And we're back here on Voice Over Body Shop. We're talking with Luke Truan and Joe Davis, talking about cybersecurity, stuff we just don't normally think think about when we're you know we're like oh send the email gotta go oh here's an audition but we just don't think about these sorts of things but george you had a bunch of questions i knew you would totally geek out on these guests so you've you've got some questions go for it totally man oh yeah my daughter was addicted to the movie home for a while the purple alien movie um <laughs> And in that movie, there was the smart, all the smart people, all the smart guys are supposed to solve all the problems. You know, and there are a bunch of aliens with giant brains plugged into the computer and they're all <laughs> pulsating. That's this room right now. This is what we're talking about here. Um, so um, in terms of web, web browsers, are some browsers better overall security wise than others that you recommend people use, whether on Mac or Windows? I know what I'm using, but what do you guys recommend in terms of just general security on your web browser. Sure, Joe, you wanna go first? Uh, so I think there's security from a standpoint of getting hacked and then there's security from a standpoint of privacy. And so they're, they're not exactly the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. 
I, and I'll be curious to hear what Luke has to say about, from the security standpoint, um, DuckDuckGo actually is a alternative to uh, Google and they have their own web browser now, which supposedly doesn't do any tracking. So as opposed to the, the company that you're using as your web browser and your search engine collecting all the information about you and building an advertising profile, you wanna avoid that and have a, a, a higher level of security, I would say DuckDuckGo would be a good way to go. Um, in terms of the, the major web browsers, meaning Firefox, Chrome, uh, Internet Explorer, which has became Edge, which is now rolling out to a new web browser that Microsoft has. Uh, personally, I like Chrome the best, um, but I am, I, I, and I think it's more secure in some ways, but it, because it's so widely used, it also gets attacked a lot. Um, but I, I'd love to hear what Luke has to say on that. And he may have a different opinion in terms of security. So I'll piggyback off of what you said is that there is definitely a difference between general security and privacy. And um, I do like DuckDuckGo. Um, I personally use StartPage and they're both kind of similar with the way they um, handle results. And so I would say um, they provide a certain level of anonymity and, and it's basically what interface you like the best in terms of that level. Um, but we're talking about search engines in, in right, this case. Search engines, Not web browsers, but search so engines. No, browsers are next, right. Uh, gotcha. But search engines, you know, DuckDuckGo and the start page, and there's, you know, there's some other ones, but those are the big ones. Um, you're, you're anonymized until you click on the link. Then they can track your IP and everything else about your browser and blah, blah, blah. So that's when the browser comes in. Uh, my favorite browser is actually typically Chrome because it's the most compatible with modern day. And I'll put that in parentheses, modern day um, websites and technologies. Um, what it still has an issue with only because they don't keep up with their technology is governmental websites. So you have to be careful with that. Um, uh, but in terms of privacy, the Chromium based browsers are right now the best in terms of actual security. There and is some times that you can do, they, the hackers can do sandbox escaping and that's been some of the vulnerabilities that have dropped in the past. And so they've done patches for that. There's pretty bad um, vulnerabilities for Google Chrome not too long ago that it affected pretty much everybody on the planet. So Joe, what were you gonna well, say? Oh, I was gonna say, Luke, can you um, define the difference between Chrome and a Chromium browser or Chromium based browser? Yeah, sure. So a Chrome, a Google Chrome is what we all know is Chrome. Um, Google did uh, basically opened up their code, basically the, uh, their entire platform to open source community and said, here's our code that we use for our, our browser, you know, not the actual proprietary code, but the general open source portion of it and said, here, build your own. And so other companies have come up and built their own Chrome type based browsers and it's called Chromium at that point. And another, uh, uh, I guess a version of that would be the new Microsoft Edge browser that's coming out. And then the Brave browser would be another example of that. All right, and all right, cool. Again, George, just to clarify, when you said those are search engines, DuckDuckGo is a search engine or a start page, but it's also a web browser. So they built their own um, web browser that you can put on your mobile device or on your computer. Right. Does it have any gotchas in terms of like, well, you know, I'm using Brave, but the audio on my P on my Mac doesn't flow. I can't use Google Hangouts for phone calls, for example. Um, did you have any idea? Have you tried that with DuckDuckGo on a Mac? I know it's pretty specific. <laughs> I, I have not tried that yet, but um, the um, the browsers that you mentioned, like Brave, for example, it does go through an encrypted channel called the Tor network, which is part of the, I guess, technically is part of the dark web, the deep web, whatever you want to call it. And so because it's encrypted, it probably doesn't pass all the necessary traffic. I haven't done the specific research on that yet, but I might now since you asked the question. Go to cool. it. <laughs> All right, another one. Um, I, I have a few more, but I'm going to whittle it down because we are getting some audience questions too. Um, let's see. And password managers. I've mentioned LastPass 
you guys find those a really, really, really smart idea using one of those pass ma password managers? <laughs> so I have some uh, kind of mixed feelings on those. Um, yeah. you know, they're kind of good and they're kind of not so great. I won't say bad because they do work well when there's not a vulnerability that you can just hack right into it. Um, but it's kind of the same philosophy of putting all of your eggs in one basket, which I don't really like to do. Um, it is okay. I'll put an asterisk there. It is okay to say use um, a password storage um, program that offers a multi-factor, meaning that when you type in your password, it sends your phone a code, then you have to type in the code. I so, was going to actually ask about two-factor authentication or multi-factor too. I, right, I'm not using that. it much because it, because of the, it seems daunting to get everything using that. So What's your favorite tool? That would be my last question, but what's your favorite tool for getting multi-factor authentication happening? Well, there's multiple tools depending on what platform you're on. For example, um, if you're using one login, then you're gonna use their multi-factor, you know, for their particular website to log in, which then would allow you to log into other websites, you know, behind the scenes. Then of course, if you're using like, um, Microsoft Office 365, they have their own version of multi-factor as well. And so, mm -hmm. and it goes so on and so on. The banks have their own. And so whatever system you're on, you're going to use their multi-factor option. I've seen uh, a lot of people with password managers where they, they keep all their passwords in there, but then the password for their password manager is just stored in a regular text document. And so, <laughs> as Luke said, you're putting Yikes. all your eggs in one basket and then that's sitting out there. So I, I think uh, password managers are only as good as their system plus your ability to protect your credentials. So if you're gonna leave those credentials out in any way, then I would say they're not a good idea. Um, they are better than just storing all your passwords in a regular document, but uh, storing your stuff in an encrypted document, or at least your, if you're gonna write your last pass or whatever password manager you use, those credentials, um, keep those encrypted too if you're going to store them anywhere. And some of these password managers do require two-factor authentication even to use them. So, and I would say if they give you that option to do that, because it, yeah, it's a, maybe a little bit of a pain in the neck and a little bit of an extra step, but it gives you that much more security. Well, I realize already that I'm using LastPass and, and anytime I'm using LastPass, I do have to go through a an unlock process to use it. So me too. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. usually, I'm usually mm -hmm. trying to remember my, pa okay. It all remembers most of my passwords, but I can't remember the password for LastPass. <laughs> yeah. There's a trick. To I, that. I, I, <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say mine, mine is a really, mine's a sentence, but it's just a sentence I created a long time ago. And for whatever reason at the time, it was easy, easy to remember. We'll Until tell you how good it is. What's the sentence? <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 your mother is a, no, um, <laughs> no, but you know, and coming up with a sentence can be sometimes a lot easier to memorize and way harder to, to hack. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Just a quick note with two factor authentication, a lot of, in fact, both now Google with Android and Apple with the iPhone allow you to check your text messages online. Right. And so if someone gets access to your online credentials, they could even get around the two-factor authentication because they could receive the, the, um, yes. the factor online, you know, the, the, the additional code or whatever it is, and then intercept it and punch it in. So even using two-factor is not unbreakable. That's yeah. right. And I'm sure somebody out there in the audience is thinking, well, there's a vulnerability about the Google password uh, second, you know, the multi-factor authentication app. There's a vulnerability against that and somebody can hack it. And that's true. There has been, but they did patch that. And, uh, but that's another way you can easily get into your accounts is that uh, you can have these different um, authentication apps like Microsoft has one. And then when you log in, it sends your uh, phone a message and it doesn't give you a code but it says approve or deny and so you don't have to worry about the code you can just kind of click your phone and go boom yes i'm in yeah so that's another way to do that and then all right keeping track of passwords there's a couple ways you can figure out if it has been involved in a public breach have i been pwned.com yeah that's a good one as well and then there's a google <laughs> extension you can put in there which also searches public breaches oh boy 
Yeah. It gets scary after a while. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. ignorance is a little bit blissful, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here's a question from a Fred Norris about file uh, virus scanners. So a lot of these other ones that you we've heard about, a lot of them are free, like AVG, Avast, and malware bytes. Do you feel like any of those are they any of those effective? So in terms of effectiveness, um, real-time scanning is not usually a feature in the free version. You get a trial with a fully functioning, you know, um, a browser protection, you know, real-time scanning and some other features. But as soon as that trial is down and finished, it's not doing any real-time protection. So it's not really going to help you in terms of like a real-time attack, either in the web browser or if something actually gets in your temp files and tries to run. Uh, but as a standalone scanning app, Malwarebytes has always been the go-to uh, basically for cleanup when somebody does have a potential issue. So you kind of get what you pay for, in other words, you know. Yeah. And also not all antivirus programs deal with malware or adware Correct. and vice versa. So you want to make sure that just because you have a program doesn't mean you're covering all of those bases. And then there's also... Um, firewall, there's all kinds, of, there's different levels of security and different types of malicious things that can be done. So, you know, a tracking cookie, which tracks what you do online, is not nearly as malicious as something that's trying to steal your browser passwords, but it's still tracking you. So you have to figure out what level you're comfortable with. That's right. And if somebody does get on your system, they can actually, um, and let's say you're logged into your bank, for example, and somebody did get on your system and you're still logged into your bank, they could actually take that bank session cookie and uh, use it again to get into your account. All right. We got Potentially. One, yeah, so. we got one last question here from Dominic Carlos. He says, uh, I've heard Joe talk about wanting your website host to be based in a server in your country. Why is that? And are there more security vulnerabilities with hosting your website out of country? Very good question. So there are various reasons, and this actually, um, I'm really glad he asked this question because I want to talk about CDNs also. Uh, so there's a SEO and also talent seeker reason to have your website hosted in the country where you want to get hired. And that's a little bit different than the country where you are physically located. So the reason to have it in the, the country where you're physically located is you probably are in the same time zone. If you need to call their support, you can. Uh, you, you speak the same language, et cetera. But the reasons to have your website hosted in the country where you're trying to generate business is that it will probably load faster because it's being served from a server there. So just physical location of the server being in that area is helpful. And then also, um, Google is aware of where your website is hosted in what country and what country is being served from. And uh, although we don't know everything that goes into Google's algorithm, we can be pretty sure that Google is going to give some sort of benefit to a website that is geographically targeted towards your audience where you're trying to reach them. And so I would say there are good reasons to host. If your target market is the US, then host in the US. Um, there is something you can use called a CDN or a content delivery network where you run your website through this cloud-based software and then it, it helps protect against security uh, problems. doesn't 100%, but it helps protect. But it will also, um, depending on which one you use, serve it from the location. They have servers all over the world and it'll serve the website from the location closest to the person that's requesting the website. So it really doesn't matter where your website's hosted. It matters that your CDN has a location in that place. CDNs can be free. They can cost money. It is a, a good one is generally a small added expense. So it depends on how important these things are to you, but that is a, a potential option. All righty. And on that note, we are sorely running out of time here, but uh, I wanted to get uh, a couple of addresses in there. Uh, first off, uh, Luke, the web address for your newsletter once again. It's the voxroundup.com. Okay. Yeah, it's HTTPS. Ah. You have to put sure, that in there. Make sure you put that in there. I just typed <laughs> the voxroundup.com into my browser, nothing special, and it came right up. Outstanding. Good to know. Just it defaults to up. HTTPS. Yeah. <laughs> make, make sure As you, you put that in there. 
And Joe, of course, we can find you at www.voiceactorwebsites.com. All right. Well, guys, <laughs> thanks for being with us tonight. And uh, I can't wait to start reading this and going, oh, I know what you're talking about. All right. <laughs> Interesting. All right. All right. Well, George and I will be uh, right back to wrap things up right after this. This is Anthony Mendez, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Show. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. From voiceoveressentials.com, it's the relationship savior, the multicolor LED VO recording sign. Not just a stock on the air or recording sign, it's our exclusive voiceover recording sign. This brilliantly lit LED 20 color beacon tells everybody at home, which is currently everybody, hey, I'm auditioning, recording, podcasting, narrating, or broadcasting here, and a few moments of relative quiet would be very much appreciated. What's more, the wafer-thin remote control lets you choose a multitude of options, from color to brightness, flashing to fade in and out. You can even set up your own personal codes. Red means I'm recording, blue playing back, green, it's a wrap. Plug in the seven foot long cord and hang it on a doorknob or wall hook using the included chain. For voice workers, silence really is golden. And gold is one of the 20 colors you can choose from. Order yours now for just $69.95 from voiceoveressentials.com. That's voiceoveressentials.com. Ooh, I think I heard the voice of a body shop. I did. I did hear the voice of a body shop. Beat old body shop. It's time to talk about our sponsor, <laughs> Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect, which is probably something by now, if you're watching this show, you've heard of. Um, Source Connect is a very popular tool for connecting your studio to others around the world, and it's never been in more demand than it is now. So uh, if you haven't already, if you're one of the few remaining voice actors who haven't done this, uh, head over to source-elements.com and sign up for a 15-day free trial. But I will say this, there's a little bit of a learning curve to get it up and running. So before you stumble around on their website, if you can't find your way through, sometimes it's a little daunting. Um, I did a, a tutorial on this and it's at georgev.tech slash sc slash sc for Source Connect. You can head over there and check out this uh, tutorial video. It's about an hour long. It covers a lot of ground, but it'll get you oriented on setting up an iLock account and setting up and installing Source Connect standard for the first time. That's the version that you need as a voice actor to be compatible with all the professional studios and engineers out there that use Source Connect. You must have Source Connect standard. So get yourself set up, get your uh, trial license running so you can be ready to go and understand how it works and have all the little details out of the way. So when you're asked, do you have Source Connect? Or your agent says, do you have Source Connect? you can actually say yes. So get ready and be prepared and get signed up with Source Connect. We'll be right back to wrap this up. Thanks for This is Anthony Mendez and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. Oh, there she goes. All right. And we're back. Uh, I'm sorry. My eyes are rolling to the back of my head. Every time I 
people start talking about this stuff, it's like whoosh. But ho- <laughs> hopefully the the Vox Roundup will make things a little more understandable for me. I definitely you? think you want to subscribe to that newsletter, Dan. I definitely sure. and I think you all should too. Uh, who are our donors of the week? We've got donors. We've got donors. We've got lots and lots of donors, as usual. We have Shauna Pennington Baird, Lee Pinney, Don Griffith, Martha Kahn, Dominic Carlos, Craig Goolsby, Pat Kennedy, Michael Kearns, and Christy Burns. Right. A couple of new names in that list. Thanks for you new donors, and thanks especially to all the recurring subscribers who uh, did the little subscription option on PayPal on the website. We appreciate it. Every little bit helps. Now, next week on this show, we're going to do Tech Talk number 33. Believe it or not, we got a re-rack for that. So if you got questions, toss them in the chat room and email them in because we love getting questions from people. Uh, also, you don't have to show us your booths right now because we're going to be in this in, in this magnificent studio until we all get to be together again, and then we'll start showing booths again. But send them in, because there's some pretty interesting booths that we've been seeing. And we've been seeing a lot more of them lately since we've been talking to people in their booths. So it's kind of interesting. Yes, we have. All righty. Well, we need to thank our sponsors like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. One of the others that we should talk about right now, but I'm not looking at the script. Uh, <laughs> VoiceOver Extra. Uh, source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And JMC Demos. All righty. And the Dan and Marcy Leonard Foundation for the betterment of live and recorded webcasting. Jeff Holman on chat room duty tonight. And our technical director joining us all the way from somewhere else in Burbank, Sue Merlino, who keeps it running. How we do this, we don't know, but it seems to be working. So I guess we'll just keep doing it for another nine years. Anyway, that's going to do it for us. Tech Talk is next. This is not an easy business. Look at all the weird stuff you got to deal with. Now cybersecurity. <laughs> but we're here to talk about it. So join us each week here on VoiceOver Body Shop. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop. Or V-O-B-S. See you next time, kids. Thank you.